Uh, Dr. Oliver Akamnonu is an author and poet, a medical doctor who specialized in anesthesiology. In his home of Nigeria, he attended St. Bridget's Catholic School and later the Government Secondary School, where he was a college scholar. He is the author of more than 12 books in the United States. Among those are Supper of Many Dishes, Taste of the West, Coming Late to America, and others. For more information, visit his website at Dr. Oliver Akamnonu, which is D-R-O-L-I-V-E-R, and then A-K-A-M-N-O-N-U dot com. Please welcome Oliver. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Oliver. Good afternoon. Okay. Matthew has kindly introduced me. Uh, my major objective in life is to write books. <laughs> <laughs> Even though um, earlier, uh, years before then, I digressed into, I say digressed into uh, medical practice, but I eventually found my niche uh, settled for writing. So, um, I've just done uh, my 21st book, but of all the books, the, first, the one that I like the most, and the one that actually pleases me to present most of the time, uh, that's why all temptations to present bigger books, is my very first book, uh, mm -hmm. which is Suppers of Many Dishes. Actually, I had come <laughs> prepared to present this, uh -huh. <laughs> but um, most, like happens in many other situations, I find I settle ultimately for suppers of many dishes. So suppers of many dishes, like you can see in the, in the image here, contains a central hut. Actually, the houses are no longer like this anymore. They used to be like this. And eight houses. And that central hut happens to be, in true life, my father's house. And these eight huts, happened to be, in true life, the eight wives of my father. <coughs> and probably I should have put 46 children because of the eight wives, he had 46 children. And I happened to be the, the third. So, Suppers of Many Dishes is a, a book written to portray that other culture across the Atlantic, which the West is not very very used to, where a man can have and marry as many wives mm -hmm. as he pleases, even though, unfortunately, the reverse is not the case. A woman cannot marry as many husbands, it usually stop to one. So I read briefly from Suffers of Many Dishes, which is a story of a young child who came from that background, and the truth is that even though this is written in fiction form, this is a true story. And that young child that is portrayed in this picture happens to be me. So now, the, the child by name, Ogwebe, uh, was born the third child in the family. And being the third child, being the third child and the second son, he was very much pampered uh, among the 46 children. And being pampered also had his responsibilities that he had to look after the much younger ones. So it is a story of that child going to school, maturing, getting into a secondary school, and ultimately getting into a medical school. Uh, we're actually trying to see if we can put this in a movie form, mm -hmm. but it's, it, takes, it takes quite some process. So I will read briefly, since I have just, I think, eight minutes. I'm, I'm sorry I've taken some four minutes out of it to introduce that. Introduce, uh, so Okoli lived, the, the, uh, the name of uh, that uh, child is Ogwebe, but he was usually called Okoli. Okoli lived with his grandmother in a section of the village called Ipa Moji. He often accompanied some local big girls, the Onu Sayans, to hunt for snails. Some of the things mentioned in this book actually are rather strange. Anywhere I go to present them, I have traveled quite a bit. Usually people 
can't imagine. But if you put yourself in a situation where you are put, you are taken from metropolitan Los Angeles or New York City and put into, I don't know where in the United States I can, I can uh, relate that to, into uh, a place where you are living with nature. Mm -hmm. Living actually with nature. It's not as primitive as it's portrayed. You know, but you find that people fall back a, a, a lot more on nature in the part of the world where I came from. Sometimes I miss it, some other times I prefer the, <laughs> the other type of life. So Okoli lived with his grandmother in that kind of a village where there was no electricity, no pipe bone water. They had streams, and the streams were not polluted. So now, uh, he often accompanied the local big girls, the Onusanyas, to hunt for snails after the rains. The snail hunting was often in the early hours of the night, and the young hunters used dim light from sticks laden with oil, fiber, or palm, palm fruits called apulabo. Those were the days when neither the hurricane lantern nor the dry cell battery torchlights had made their debut in Okoli's village. You can imagine, it looks like the dark ages, doesn't it? You know, where they didn't have hurricane lanterns, but they made do with sticks dipped in oil, and then uh, the oil would will uh, burn as it's put into the fire. So at night, the little children usually went to the low bushes to hunt for snails. I don't know how many of you know snails. They're, <laughs> yeah, they are creeping, <laughs> creeping animals with big shells. You know, uh, probably, I don't know, probably, uh, I don't know how, how to describe them. They're kind of slimy. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then those are the days when neither the hurricane lantern nor the dry cell battery torchlight had made their debut in Okoli village. The light bushes wet from the rains and rotting vegetation provided good breeding grounds for those snails. Snails usually feed on rotting vegetation. The frogs that, uh, that often came out uh, at such times of the night also had to hunt for food and were sometimes also hunted frogs and not toads. You know, uh, when I read this, sometimes people tend to confuse frogs with toads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> now, the letter would, however, be readily dumped away from the hunter's bags and the clay collection pots once they were identified. Once in a while, a species of snakes called a kelba, which often came out at such times of the night also to hunt for food, would send shivers through the young hunters. But for the biggest of the girls who Okoli often went snail hunting with, was never afraid of the Ekoba. The Ekoba were kind of a, not vipers, I don't, I'm not sure, I think kind of a boa, boa, boas, but not, not as big, not as bad as they, they usually you could hold them. Uh, but they can occasionally twist themselves. On your, on your hands, but they really beat uh, human beings. So, Mbapo, the biggest of the girls who Okoli often went snail hunting with, was never afraid of the Ekoba. She would use a, snake, a, a, a stick to uncall any Ekoba away from a big snail if she saw the former attempting to swallow the latter. Because when the, the, the young hunters, when the children would be hunting for, for the snails, the echo by those snakes would also come out to hunt for the snails. And sometimes a, a, a child could go to catch a snail, not knowing that a snake, the echo but was also nearby hunting for the same snails. <laughs> so uh, these, there were amazing references uh, to these snakes. The echo were by the much older villagers. The Ekoba was said to be harmless, and it was a taboo to kill or harm it in any way. But the taboo went only as far as the elderly natives were concerned. This was especially so for those natives in the village who had not been converted to Christianity, and these were in the majority in Okoli's village. As a matter of fact, this book was written, uh, depicts a picture of the earlier days when the missionaries were still new in Africa. 
it goes on to, to a situation where it describes wrestling combat. That is the thing that Okoli and his friend did at school. And then the Catholic priest that never was. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, there were occasionally controversies about some of the things uh, uh, written here, but I guess that that goes to add to the uh, to the phone in the story. And then the resident traditional medicine man uh, in in, the, in that part of the world also we had traditional medicine men who did voodoo. Do you know Haiti? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, that uh, voodoo is a kind of, uh, it's, not, it's not witchcraft, but it's a kind of belief in, uh, in, in witchcraft. But it's not witchcraft itself. There's a difference between witchcraft and voodoo. Mm -hmm. So, incidentally, uh, the, the traditional medicine men were very highly respected. Mm -hmm. And people who had a lot of money, people who could afford it, occasionally had some personal traditional medicine men. As a matter of fact, as explained in this book, my own father had a traditional medicine man all to himself. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, usually uh, the beliefs in those, in those days, in the, the days that I grew up, actually I met these things. When I, when I wrote uh, this book, like I said, is actually a true story, even though it's in fiction form. And the time I was growing up, these things have started fading away. But some people still kept the traditions going on. And my father happened to be one of those people who kept the traditions going, going strong. Incidentally, uh, there's, a, there's a tendency to believe that, uh, that witchcraft was the, the general practice and that the people didn't have a culture. But in actual fact, even in the midst of the witchcraft and the sorcery and all the kinds of uh, things that you might not expect in the Western world here, the society was very highly organized. And children were taught from early childhood to uphold certain things. Uh, corporal punishment was the norm, even though it's not, it's not tolerated in the West. But that was the culture in which some of us grew up. If a child did something wrong and you warn him the first time and warn him a second time, the third time around, you no longer warn him, you will smack him. But we didn't beat them. I was beaten. I was. I, I had a. I had a stick meant for me. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, and as described in this book, the stubborn children, after they were disciplined at home and they did not comply, would be sent away to live with their uncles or with their aunties. And I was sent. I was sent away to live. I didn't grow up with my parents. I was sent away. They said I used to fight a lot, and the sticks didn't control me, and. I was sent and I lived with my uncle until I entered the, I entered the high school. So, so parts of many dishes, like I said, I'm, so, I'm so, sorry, my, I'm bringing my time is uh, up to another, another minute. Okay, so it's actually a true story, but written in fiction form, and it describes the life of a growing child in that part of the world. Some, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. And I felt that some of these things needed to be documented so that even though they are no longer fully being practiced now, that the, the traditions and the stories of the days that some of us grew up should not be completely forgotten. That is the essence of Surface of Many Dishes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. That's fascinating.